America is the indispensable nation, and we can do almost anything we want domestically and internationally as long as we believe hard enough. Okay, well, that may work in a, in a Hollywood script, but uh, in the real world where the enemy has a vote, yeah, not so much. And uh, we have nobody better to break down reality and what things are like actually on the ground than Douglas McGregor, retired Army colonel, uh, CEO of Our Country, Our Choice, which we're going to be talking about a little bit more later in this uh, telecast here, uh, retired, uh, a decorated combat veteran, former uh, advisor to the Secretary of Defense. Doug, welcome back to the show. Good to be with you. Uh, the, now, we're going to cut into that. And there's there's a lot of things that uh, specifically are related to that, as it, as uh, some things that have been said by a lot of our so-called senior leaders and, and leading voices out there that have a lot to do uh, with our national security, especially if some of our uh, political leaders listen to these guys. But before we do that, I want to touch on something that's really been kind of flying around the, the Internet and social media over the weekend and has a lot of people alarmed uh, and that is that Trump has uh, allegedly said that he'd let Russia do, quote, whatever the hell they want to NATO countries that don't pay enough. Now, a lot of the liberal media, especially, has been jumping all over this and saying, you know, man, he's literally going to let our uh, NATO allies go to Russia. In fact, some of the headlines even said that he's encouraging Russia to do that. And they, you know, oh, my God, or whatever. When you look at his comments in context, though, it's a little bit different picture. And we have this for you to watch. I did the same thing with NATO. I got them to pay up. NATO was busted until I came along. I said, everybody's going to pay. They said, well, if we don't pay, are you still going to protect us? I said, absolutely not. They couldn't believe the answer. And everybody, you never saw more money pour in to Secretary General Stoltenberg. Well, I don't know if he is anymore, but he was my biggest fan. He said, all these presidents came in, they'd make a speech, they'd leave, and that was a bit. And they all owed money, and they wouldn't pay it. I came in, I made a speech, and I said, you got to pay up. They asked me that question. One of the presidents of a big country stood up and said, well, sir, uh, if we don't pay and we're attacked by Russia, will you protect us? I said, you didn't pay? You're delinquent? He said, yes, let's say that happened. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. You got to pay. You got to pay your bills. And the money came flowing in. So in context, he was talking about something that happened during his 2016 or his, his first administration. But, Doug, he's really been saying this simple or consistent message from the 2016 campaign all the way up through this speech here, which is that NATO doesn't need to be a freeloader. We don't need to just be doing whatever NATO wants. Uh, they should pay their fair share. Now, I want to before I hear your comments, I want to juxtapose that with the current president who seems to have, well, a different message. You can't tell me whether you're going to be able to go home tonight. No one can be sure what they're going to do. I'm saying as sure as anything can possibly be said about American foreign policy, we will stay connected to NATO. Connected to NATO beginning, middle, and end. We're a transatlantic partnership. That's what I've said. Now, I know that you you have uh, spent some time with uh, President Trump, and, and I know you worked some during his administration. Uh, a lot of people say, well, Trump is just using hyperbole. He doesn't actually mean that. He's just trying to show that he wants NATO to pay, pay, pay its fair share. But I think on the other side, you see that Biden is basically saying, if you pay, that's great. But if you don't, no problem. We're still going to do everything, which, of course, they're going to go, OK, cool. Then we'll still not pay our fair share and we'll just take your security. How do you see all that playing out in terms of what Trump said? President Trump uh, does like hyperbole. I mean, remember, he is, after all, a native New Yorker. And he, from time to time, uses language that perhaps others would not. You know, he, he likes to talk uh, almost in uh, gangster terms from time to time to make his point. Either you pay up or, you, or you're on your own kind of thing. But yes, he made the point that they, they certainly had to pay their fair share. He was also trying to tell them, look, you've got to be your own first responder. You know, warfare has changed. Technology has changed. The world has changed. The probability that we could move large forces across the Atlantic in any sort of reasonable time to make much difference out on the border with uh, Belarusia, that is white Russia or Russia itself or Ukraine, is just not reasonable. And we also don't have the forces that we had 33 years ago uh, with the depth and the equipment to do the job. 
so he was saying, look, you know, if you you really you really have to look carefully at your responsibilities, and if you don't pay, uh, no, I'm not going to walk out of the NATO alliance, but I'm going to reconsider what we're doing. In the meantime, you need to be your own first responder. I think that was it. Now Biden, Biden is just you know signing up for no change in the status quo. That's it. He's all about no change. If you like the way things are right now, by God, vote for J Joe Biden. You'll get them, and they'll be worse. Right. And, and you know what? I, I, I want to drill in on that point because I think it bears emphasizing that, that almost never gets even mentioned, much less emphasized, is that why should the U.S. be the, the first responder for the continent of Europe when they have all these rich countries there who should, by all rights, be providing their own first response? And they should be on their own accord making a, a military uh, equipment and, and structure, whatever, to defend their country. And then if needed, then their, their ally can come and help over the shoulder. But it's like, no, they want us to be at the front and actually seems to demand that we do so. Well, keep something else in mind. Uh, and this is a point that we've, that you and I have discussed previously and needs to be made again and again. Russia presents no existential threat to NATO or Europe. Now, back in January, February of 2022, uh, and that lasted until probably almost June. The argument was, oh, look at Russia. The Russian military is too small. The Russian military can't do anything right. The Russians are incompetent. Right. Uh, now, how do, you, how do you square this particular circle? On the one hand, you're trying to argue that Russia was armed to the teeth, ready to attack West and uh, conquer Europe, and therefore we have to arm to the teeth to defend. On the other hand, you point out that, no, they, they weren't ready for anything. They were grossly underwhelming in terms of numbers and equipment. It, it doesn't work. And the point is now, you know, Trump, President Trump knew that Russia presented no immediate threat to Europe whatsoever. And he was simply saying, you, you know, defend yourselves first and foremost. Be your own first responder. We don't expect Europeans to show up and defend the continental United States if we are attacked. So why are you expecting us to throw in 100% over a border dispute you may have on, in the East somewhere? But, you know, again, everything yeah. is misrepresented because, again, everything is about the threat to money. Everything in Washington revolves around the flow of cash. If you talk in terms, and frankly, I think NATO has long since out, outlived its utility, and you talk about scaling back your investment in something like NATO, that has huge repercussions inside Washington. Yeah. Look at all the phony think tanks. I call them phony because they're not think tanks. They're what I call advocacy tanks. That's what Chaz Freeman says. They're, they're just there to push for an agenda. All of these tanks will be out of business. You mean you can't talk about perpetual war with Russia anymore? You mean the Europeans will actually stand up and do something independently of us? Even though they pay lip service to that sort of thing, the truth is they can't live without the dispensation of cash that comes from all these, you know, sacred cows that deserve to be slain. Yeah. And and that's a perfect segue into to what we want to talk about next. And in fact, the actual title of this segment here is The Deadly Myth of U.S. Invincibility. And one of the reasons why I was eager to have you on to talk about this, because you always talk about what's going on on the ground and, and the reality, the capabilities, what we actually can do what is, is going to be a big challenge and not just this pie in the sky that we can do everything we want to, uh, because it's not like we're weak, but we do have limitations and we have to be cognizant of those. Now, there are those in Washington, I know you're going to be shocked about this, that actually want to pretend like we can literally do anything we want and there won't be even consequences, much less a cost. And uh, first of all, I want to look at the situation uh, with uh, Iran in the Middle East and with the attacks on our troops in, in Iraq and in Syria and the, the lust that some people have to go after them into Iran, because you've been tweeting about this, which I'll hit in just a second. But as a setup, let's see what they're actually saying. And first of all, uh, I want to look at uh, Brother Jack Keane, who in this case will sound a little bit like a peacenik, because he's like saying, hey, no more war, with one important caveat. An attack on Iranian soil? Should that be part of the plan? It should be. Why, of course it should be. 
Absolutely. We're not talking about a go-to-war attack on Iran that we've seen before when we lit up Baghdad. Nobody's advocating anything like that. When the administration says, well, we don't want to escalate, we don't want to widen the war, and no, no one wants a war with Iran, well, of course, no one's proposing a war with Iran. But holding Iran accountable in terms of some of the IRGC assets, the leadership and their physical assets themselves, in a limited, measured way, makes sense and letting them know that we won't stop there. Yeah, I mean, all he's saying is this just hit their troops, their leadership, and their assets in their country, and there won't be a war. I mean, that's not a big deal. But then, actually, Brother Kellogg, uh, former General Kellogg, wants to go a little further. They have to do what I would call super escalate. They have to take it to a level that everybody's uncomfortable, including those in the Situation Room, where you go to a level, you say, okay, this isn't a gamble. It's a risk, and we understand the risks involved. But until we make a clear message, we send a clear message, these are going to continue. So you have to go outside of your normal box, and you have to break the escalation ladder. Either attack the Quds Force leaders, that's Ismail Ghani, or the Supreme Leader Khamenei, or the facilities they've got in Iran. But somebody has to make a hard call, because now we've reached a point where we're going to have to do something very hard, very strong, and the response is going to be probably... But that from their end, it could be proportionate. So be prepared for that. That's that's I mean, going after the head of state again. I don't think he doesn't want a war, but we can knock him out. So now I don't know this. I'm going to show one more piece here. But, and I don't know if you had Lindsey Graham in mind when you made these tweets, which I'll show in just a second. But this part, I think, was a little bit more over the top because the disconnect that Lindsey Graham seems to have with reality. Without Iran, there are no hooties. The Houthis are completely backed by Iran. I've been saying for six months now, hit Iran. They have oil fields out in the open. They have the um, Revolutionary Guard headquarters you can see from space. Blow it off the map. Here's what we need to do. You need to hit something that Ayatollah values. His leadership team, like a Soleimani, or take him out of the oil business. If we hit their oil infrastructure, you don't need manned aircraft. They've got four refineries you can see from space. If you knock one of them out, they would stop this. If the goal is to deter Iran, you're failing miserably. So all of these guys say that we should conduct acts of war and bomb inside of Iran in order to deter them and to make them back down. But a couple of days ago, you tweeted these uh, these ones here, which you say bombing campaigns show that you are at war with an opponent. The assumption that we can do something without ending up in a major war is a false one. And then Washington knows that Iran is resolved to fight the U.S. if the U.S. forces attack it. An American leg strategic bombing offensive against Iran will produce Rain of fire on the 57,000 American soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines in the Middle East. And then lastly, American policymakers must not be duped into believing that a U.S. military technology is unique or superior or that U.S. armed forces on land or sea are immune to large-scale precision strikes. When you write those things, Doug, and, and you hear comments like this, I mean, what's, what's going through your mind? Well, perhaps, uh, and I'm sure some of the viewers are wondering about this right now, perhaps General Keene has some sort of written assurances from the leadership of the Iranian state that they will understand that these are limited strikes meant to effectively uh, push Iran back into its quote-unquote box. I, I don't know. It could be that he genuinely believes that uh, he can do these things without significant strategic repercussions. Now, as far as Kellogg and, and Graham are concerned, uh, they're arguably far more dangerous than uh, Keene, although they're all equally dangerous simply because they don't understand the consequences of their actions. But Graham and, and Kellogg, and to a lesser extent Keene, all seem to think that Iran is a larger version of Iraq, that Iran is isolated, that Iran's equipment is antiquated, that its armed forces are weak and incapable that Iran can be bullied and, and pulverized the way we bullied and pulverized Iraq. Uh, I don't think that's going to work, Dan, but uh, that's their view. It's very dangerous. And as you point out, you know, let's set aside the United States Constitution. That's all, all obviously irrelevant. Plays no role any longer in decision making in Washington. There is a war party that is largely indistinguishable from the swamp, the Uniparty. The war party wants war. For them, this has been a very enriching experience. 
uh, I'm sure that if we were able to get control or, or access to information about these various retired three and four stars who have been strong advocates for intervention and meddling in the affairs of other countries, we'd find out that they've grown dramatically richer in retirement than they ever were when they were on active duty. As far as Lindsey Graham is concerned, you could just look at his principal uh, donors to, to the PACs that support him, and it's no mystery that he's the darling of the military industrial complex. Uh, everyone is, is sees an opportunity here to make lots of money, but there won't be money to be made unless they're talking about rebuilding portions of the United States as well as Europe and uh, probably in the Middle East. In other words, we cannot act with impunity. If you start expanding this unfortunate campaign of assassinating members of other people's governments. By the way, we did that with Soleimani. I oppose that. Soleimani was a member of the Iranian national government. He was effectively the national security advisor to the supreme leader. He sat in on the, all of the council meetings. We killed him. We literally assassinated him. And that was a serious mistake in my judgment. Everybody said, well, he killed Americans. Well, I, as I told one person, uh, what would we do if an occupying army were in Mexico? Would we help the Mexicans? Uh, I think so. And we'd like to see that occupying army the hell out of the Western Hemisphere. Well, gee, yeah. what do you think the Iranians did? Uh, it, in other words, this is not personal. This is war. And there are interests at stake. This, these people don't understand that from Iran's standpoint, what they're talking about is unambiguously an act of war. They will respond to it in kind. They will use everything at their disposal to attack us. That includes attacks in our hemisphere, through our open borders, and from agents already inside the United States. And more important, it will, it will absolutely redound to our disadvantage in the region. The 57,000 Americans will be targeted, and they have enough missiles, enough rockets, enough military power to do enormous damage. And again, there's this falsehood that well, the Houthis wouldn't be there if it weren't for Iran. Wrong. The Houthis were there long, long before Iran was around. Mm. They turned to Iran in desperation because the Saudis were trying to exterminate them. And we chipped in and helped. So yeah. then they went to the Iranians. The Iranians grudgingly gave them weapons, but told them from the beginning, we can't do much for you. You're, you're going to have to make peace on your own. They, they said, we've tried. No one will listen to us. So now the Houthis are simply demonstrating their solidarity with all of the other Muslim Arabs in the region against Israel. If you want what's happening to stop, stop what's going on in Gaza. It's that simple. We, we're not going to do that. Yeah. We have to reckon with more bloodshed, destruction in the region. Yeah, I think that's one of the bigger problems that we have is that, like, and I've never... Uh, well, actually, I won't say I've never heard Keen talk about this. He does in a dismissive way, as as well as some of these people. They say, well, oh, and I don't want to hear any of that nonsense that this has something to do with the Houthis uh, in, in, in the Israeli war. It doesn't. They're just doing this on their own, as though out of nowhere they started attacking shipping in the Red Sea. Or that out of nowhere you had this massive spike of attacks on our troops, and they're all directly tied to explicitly by the attackers to the war going on between Israel and Hamas. We don't want to even talk about that because we don't want to do that. That gets back in again to we want to do whatever we want to do. We don't want any cost or consequences, but that's just not how it works in real life. Unfortunately, it looks like the White House has not yet earned, learned that lesson because when specifically asked, now this is at close to the official level, uh, Jake Sullivan, would we go into Iran or would we not? Here's what he said. We are prepared uh, to deal with anything that any group or any country tries to come at us with. And the president has been clear that we will continue to respond to threats that American forces face as we go forward. The president is determined to respond forcefully to attacks on our people. Are strikes inside Iran off the table? Uh, again, Kristen, sitting here on television, it would not be wise for me uh, to talk about what we're ruling in and ruling out. Now, he, he didn't quite go far enough to, to say what we would do, because I think he wants to keep a flexibility, but obviously he wants to. Here's the problem, Doug, and this kind of gets back to your to some of your comments in the tweets earlier about what our capacity is. When you talk about President Biden, he seems to think there are no limits. And this is what he said at the beginning of the Israeli-Hamas war about the United States. We're the United States of America, for God's sake. The most powerful nation in the history, not in the world, in the history of the world. 
the history of the world. So he literally thinks we can do anything, but you keep dra drawing this very strong path toward the threat to the American, the 57,000 Americans in the Middle East region are directly tied to what happens if we do hit Iran. Uh, and he's apparently not doing anything to get rid of them. Now, I have been told through some uncorroborated sources just early this morning that apparently the White House is considering actually withdrawing those troops or at least getting them redeployed to better places. I hope that's true, but I haven't heard anything uh, uh, publicly about it. But if you were advising this administration, what would you advise that they do regarding all of this situation? Well, a couple of things. First of all, remember, <clears throat> and Americans may not be aware of this, but both the governments of, Ur of Iraq and Syria are effectively kicking us out of their countries. Remember, our presence in Syria has always been illegal under international law, which we, of course, treat with complete contempt. But now it's become very, very clear that if we don't get out of both Syria and Iraq, all of our troops in those areas will be under very severe threat. People don't understand that the weapons used against us to this point are really rather modest and tend on the whole to be weapons that have been around for some time. The newest capabilities have not yet been employed against us. And there has not been universal agreement among the Arabs to attack us. That's building. And right now, Syria and Iraq want to get rid of us. I predict that we will soon witness a break in relations with both Egypt and Jordan. Both of those countries are sick of what's happening in Gaza, and they are frustrated with our failure to reign in the Israelis, which, as I said before, we will not do. When that occurs, it's going to be very difficult for Americans in Egypt and Jordan, and I predict ultimately in Saudi Arabia, to stay there. And mm -hmm. I think we'll be booted. So we will have effectively alienated the entire region against us. And I don't see any return to the, the previous normalcy that we've enjoyed. Remember, both, both Biden and Netanyahu will tell you, and I, I'm very confident in this, don't worry about the Muslims. They've never united. They're always divided. They're always fragmented. They can't do anything. We can dominate them. Privately, I'm sure that's what they think. But as I've tried Actually, to tell okay. people, things are changing, and they've changed in the region. This, the states are not what they were. Egypt had 40 million people living in it in 1973. Today, there are 100 million. If the Egyptian government fails to act to protect people on the border with Gaza, if they sit there and, and allow the Israelis to take over that border and attack the, the Arabs that live there, however many differences they may have with the Palestinians that live in Gaza, that government in Egypt will not last. It'll be removed. And the same thing is true in Jordan. There are millions of Palestinians living in Jordan watching what's happening both in Gaza and the West yeah. Bank. It's a different ball game now. And unfortunately, as is the case with most senior military and political leaders, they don't get it. They haven't seen the change. They don't perceive it. Now, it seems to me that that actually to forestall that outcome that you're talking about there, it would be wise to get our troops removed from the, those, the, the harm's way, take them out of Iraq and Syria where they're not doing anything for us anyway, just being pointless targets on their back. But how do you respond to those people who claim uh, with incredulity that if you do that, you'll hand a victory to Iran because that's exactly what they want. So you're helping Iran out by getting rid of our troops here. How do you respond to those threats? Well, we heard the same sort of nonsense about Iraq. In truth, uh, the Iranians had, uh, for all intents and purposes, seized control of events inside Iraq from roughly December 2003 until the present. Uh, we knew that the president of Iraq uh, the prime minister, they were riding around in Iranian aircraft. There were Iranian translators operating within the framework of, of our military establishment living in Iraq. We don't control anything. We lost the initiative there a long time ago. President Trump understood that and wanted to get the forces out. That's one of the things that he told me, if you can do it after Afghanistan, we need to get out of Syria and Iraq. Of course he was right. There's no purpose in them being there. Their presence alone is enough. Remember, by the time the you know we'd been in Iraq for a year, all we did was provide a target array for the growing insurgency. And how many times did we kill the insurgency? How many times did a spokesman invade, oh, we've destroyed them and they're finished and they can do nothing? 
we, we get this sort of ridiculous nonsense over and over and over again, and Americans go back to sleep. I hope Americans will start to wake up because what happens over there now will find its way here to the United States. This will not be a cost-free venture by any stretch of the imagination. Now, that, that actually, it's almost like you had my script here, because that brings me to another thing that I want to bring up here, uh, something from actually your website, uh, something you published not on your new organization, Our Country, Our Choice, uh, where you address that very issue. And then I want to ask you a question on the back side of this. Gary, play that tape. I'm speaking to you today because America confronts its biggest crisis since World War II. However, this time, the existential threats to the American people are not thousands of miles away on some foreign battlefield. The threats are here at home. Some call the threat the deep state. Others point to the swamp. Regardless of what we call them, the threats from political corruption, deceit, and the collapse of integrity in American government are real. Our country is in free fall. It's time to fight back. Americans' traditional values of God, country, and family are under attack. If you love our country, please join us. Our country needs you. Together, we can change the destiny of our nation. Let us show you how. Now, that's, that intrigues me because it seems as though the very things you're talking about are kind of what we've been talking about here, that whatever you want to call it, deep state, the, the it's a foreign policy elite or whatever, they're trying to take us in directions that are causing us more harm, especially on these issues here. We could also, of course, talk about issues on the border, which which you talk about a lot. Uh, but they also are preventing things that make sense, like standing up to Netanyahu when he's going in directions that are antithetical to our interests or withdrawing those troops in there. I, you know, I just I was thinking, Doug, that as you were talking there a second ago, if Trump had succeeded in, in you know, making the the. I guess the, whoever these people were in the administration that worked against him at the end, and he actually succeeded in getting those troops out before he left office, there would be no one there to attack right now. Those three troops would still be alive today, and any that continue to die because they're at risk, as you point out, that also could have been prevented. But this group won't allow that to happen. They keep them there for their own reasons, whatever. So you're you're identifying that threat to America, and I think it's very valid. But then at the end, you say join us because together we can help. So I wonder if you could tell our audience what can be done, what can people do? Well, let, let's talk about a couple of things before we go to that particular answer, which I'm happy to provide. The first is that historically, when you remove us from the equation somewhere, the dynamics in the region, the original dynamics that have existed there for thousands of years reassert themselves. In other words, the world doesn't end. It has a habit of reverting to the cultural strategic mean in the region. If you get out of the way, if you remove your forces from view, you'd be surprised who begins to shoot at and attack each other. You know, the, the principal powers in the region for the last 2000 years have been Persia and the Turks. What do you think happens when we are not part of the equation? Those two will struggle for power, struggle for dominance. It's in the DNA. And this is an argument that I've made repeatedly. The Israelis used to understand this, but now they've thrown overboard their historic strategy in favor of this strategy of annihilation of everyone in the region that refuses to bow down and worship them. That's not going to work. That's, it could well mean the end of the Israel, Israel's existence, in my judgment, because they're doing something that no one's been able to do, certainly since Salah Hadin, and that is to unite the Muslim world against them. And that's going to be a tough nut to crack, and I don't see it succeeding. So that needs to be understood. The second thing is that Hunter Dorenzis wrote a very good piece. I think it was in the conservative, uh, the American conservative, about what, what is this thing called American first? And he points out that the, the phrase America first was actually a campaign slogan used by Woodrow Wilson for his reelection. <laughs> so why the Trump thing first, huh? <laughs> yeah, but why, why is that significant? Because Woodrow Wilson said he promised to keep us out of war. He believes in America first. These were the placards that people carried. And Americans liked that because Americans said, we don't want anything to do with the war in Europe. Why are we involving ourselves? As we all know, it was a lie. We were ultimately dragged into it. We have lots of people talk about 
we went to rescue the banks that had uh, lent too much money, credit, and so forth to, to the allies. We had to bail out the allies. I'll let other people argue over that. But the bottom line is Americans did not want to go to war then. They do not want to go to war this time either. So that needs to be understood. It doesn't make any difference what Kellogg thinks and his insane notion of super escalate could, could result in a mammoth regional, if not global war. I mean, these people are just immensely stupid. You have Russia and China deeply involved. And that's not because they hate us. It's because they have vital strategic interests in the region. Now, do we? Not what we used to have. And, and to be frank, the only interest we have is in peace and stability and hopefully the survival of Israel. But Israel's survival is not guaranteed if we do the things that they advocate. Right. Now, there's right. something else to bear in mind. And, and, and our forces are not ready for anything. It's just nonsense. The Navy, which has historically been regarded as the first line of defense, is in terrible shape. They can't man the ships they've got. They can't recruit. The standards have fallen through the floor for all of the armed forces to drag people in to do something. People don't want to be part of it. Why? Well, we can talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, all that business and affirmative action. All those things are terrible. They all need to go away. But the point is, the maintenance is down. The ships are not ready. We don't have the inventories of missiles and rockets and the other things that we need to fight. The U.S. Army is a shadow of its former self. It, frankly, it's a bad joke. The discipline is very mediocre, un, un, unequal to the task. Yeah. This all reminds me of something that happened. You know, the, the neocons want to convince everyone that we live permanently in the 1930s and the permanent threat is all of Hitler, you know. Right. Right. At the time, most people in Europe saw the threat as Stalin, not Hitler, by the way. But the, the bottom line is that you had Neville Chamberlain and, and others who, who were saying, well, uh, we need to make it clear to these people that if they go into Czechoslovakia, there'll be a war. Well, the British general staff almost had heart attacks collectively and said, we're not ready for a war. Finally, more sober minds prevailed and said, look, we can't threaten to do something that we cannot do. If we threaten and we fail, it's a bluff. When it becomes clear it's a meaningless bluff, they will smash us. Britain was not prepared to go to war in 1938. It really wasn't as prepared as it needed to be in 1940. But what happened in 38 bought a couple of years for Britain. That did make a difference. My point is that we can't bluff. And that's what these people are about, bluffing. Yeah. Now, and, you know, I, it seems to me, Doug, even if you actually believe that, you know, the, all these risks were out there, if these people had any clue about the capacity of our armed forces, especially the Army and the Navy and the, the Air Force to a lesser extent, then they would say, let's shut down all these pointless risks of going to war and get our folks, get our force back trained up so that it can actually handle it. Because if they blind themselves to that, they could literally get us into something we could lose. Well, that, that's the whole point. And that was the point in 1938. And I think they saw a lot of evidence for that in 1940, did they not? And it took four more years before anybody could return to the continent of Europe and do anything. So I think, you know, we need to, we need to back off and reconsider what it is that we can actually do. More yeah. important, reconsider what it is that we want to do. And, and when you were talking about OCOC, our country, our choice, you know, somebody said, well, you're an American first organization. I would say, yes, we do have a version of American first policies. And, and those things range from acknowledging that we're overstretched. We can't maintain 800 bases. We have uh, defense commitments with 68 different countries. We can't no, honor all of these. It's beyond our ability. We, nor should we. It's time for retrenchment, which is exactly what you just said. We need to tend to things here at home. Now, having said that, what what can we do and what do we want to do with our country, our choice? First, we need to build membership. If we are not millions, we're not going to have an impact. Right now, we're up to 180,000 and we're continuing to grow, and that's fine. But we need millions. Secondly, these people aren't just joining to, to go to rallies. These people are not just joining to watch videos. We want to recruit we want to recruit Americans from outside the Beltway to come to Washington and govern. We want candidates who don't take money from corporate donors. 
We want independent candidates who say, no, I finance my campaign at my own expense and with the help of people who will vote for me. That's called a republic and that's real democracy. We also want to bring people to Washington to replace this enormous bureaucracy. I like I said, that. Well, where are you going to get all these qualified people? And I said, well, you know, we've been drawing heavily on people from the Ivy Leagues and the service academies. That hasn't worked out very well. So you're telling me that if somebody didn't go to an Ivy League school or to the service academy, that they could not possibly be qualified to hold a position of any kind in the federal bureaucracy? I said, you're out of your mind. Those are the people we need. These are the people that have an interest. It's called the United States of America. They're not there to pursue someone else's agenda, a foreign agenda. They're there to serve the American people. And that's a big part of what we want to do. We want to build this membership so that there is weight in numbers and we cannot be ignored, but also we want to recruit people who at some point are going to come to Washington. When I say at some point, that could be in six months. That could be in a year. I think things are on a very fragile foundation right now in this country. And we have to have people that want to serve the interests of the American people. We want to identify them, know who they are, so we can bring them in to work for us. What we don't want are retreads from <laughs> old administrations. That's death. That's right. Which is kind of how it works in this town or has, has been for a while. Well, Doug, thank you so much for coming on Dan and providing this really ground truth observation of what really is going on and, and also a vision for, for what we could do in the future. That's one of the things we like to do in here. And one of the reasons we like to have you on, because this is not about just gloom and doom and talking about how bad things are, but there actually is a path for the American people. There, there are millions of magnificent, wonderful Americans. Uh, and if we can get rid of some of this crust at the top, that's ossified over the top of us and putting us all at risk, our country can still be an amazing place. That's a great way to put it, Dan. Well, right. thanks ever so much, Doug, for coming on. Uh, look forward to having you back as, uh, as soon as you're available here. And uh, to all you at home, we remain unintimidated and uncompromised on bringing you the truth, the things that you need, like this piece here that Doug was talking about, uh, to make sense of your world around you. And if you want to do something, we uh, recommend you go to, to Doug's website and, and get on that list uh, and watch what's going on, because that could be the path to making something good happen for our country. We thank you very much and uh, come back at uh, one o'clock because we're going to have uh, Cyrus Jensen, a, a China expert, talk to us about how things are not quite the way they look there. And if you want the truth on that one, come back at two o'clock. We'll see you then on Daniel Davis Deep Dive.